Yo my peoples, what's up? My name is Jason and I'm from the Shelf Stories YouTube channel and I'm here in the Dice Tower today to review Duffers, a golf inspired deck building game for one to four players. This one was designed by Dwayne Weecroft and published by TGG Games is a deck builder uh, with a very cute whimsical take on golf. You'll be gonna be completing nine holes, upgrading your bag, getting equipment and crew, uh, all that good golfing stuff. There's also a solo mode that I'd be happy to show you once I get everything to the table. So without further ado, let's go to the videotape and I will show you Duffers. All right, welcome to a game fully laid out of Duffers. I have a two player game laid out, it goes up to four. Solo mode is completely different. I will show you that at the end of this multiplayer rules explanation. So you can see it's a big board, <laughs> lots of stuff, two different uh, market setups and uh, oversized areas. These nine cards represent the nine holes uh, that you will try to complete during a game of duffers. I have this neoprene mat. This is sold separately. I recommend this simply in order to get clarity, uh, lay things out and make sure that everything is okay, but it is not necessary. You can just play uh, with the basic components. All right, so this is a deck builder. I know this looks like a lot, but it comes together if you've played any deck builder uh, in your past gaming life, uh, this will come together pretty quickly. Let me go ahead and show you a bit, uh, starting player hand. There's two types of cards. These are terrible. <laughs> Don't worry about these for now. I'll show you those in a second. But for the most part, these are where the money is at. So this is a chip shot card, and it has two different possible functions. First, you can play it onto one of these holes. It will give you some yardage and tell you how many strokes. That matters for your score or you can play it for its credit value and go shopping in the market, which I'll show you in just a second. So as your deck develops, you can have better and better cards. You can actually do multiple actions in the turn. Say you wanna play a couple of cards in order to make a shot, a couple of cards in order to uh, shop in the market. But for the most part, one card equals one action, either one of these two things. All right, let me go ahead and show you the market. All right, so I have zoomed in on the market, which is one of the possible actions on a turn. I'm gonna show you the market first, uh, really because while it's not the core action of the game, you absolutely need to go after the market pretty hard early <laughs> in order to have a prayer of, of completing any of the holes and scoring points. Okay, so reverse style market, uh, when you buy a card, another card will pop out of a deck, and this is a giant deck, and I think the game does a pretty good job of not a lot of repeats, variations on themes, but you get different things, uh, you're gonna have a different look. It'll take you a couple games to see everything. Okay, so the main heart of the game are these driver cards. That's how you generate the yardage that you need in order to accomplish holes. So there's lots and lots of these in the deck. So then uh, lots of yardage over here, 275 yards is huge, but oh my God, look at that credit. <laughs> uh, that's not such a good thing. Uh, an example of you know lower yardage and you know lower cost. You're gonna see a lot of those uh, clubs. When you play the game, you will have to play multiples of these in order to accomplish what you want. When you do go for a hole, you are going to need at one, one of these putters. So putters in golf, you got to get it in the hole and every putting card is going to depict a, a flag. So this is kind of your finisher over here. So you absolutely need one of these putters in order to uh, get that in. And really they generally don't give you a lot of yards, but they reduce the number of strokes. If you know golf, the less strokes, the better. You also get equipment, equipment, uh, you know, lucky hat and all sorts of other <laughs> Uh, bags and vests and gloves and all that kind of thing. Generally, the equipment is going to be how you manipulate your card draw, car hand management, uh, that aspect of deck building. Calling cards will generally be uh, your equipment, so you get uh, some options there. And finally, you get the equipment, or the not the equipment, the crew. These tend to stick around, so uh, they will give you an ongoing buff. Sometimes they kind of like hop from player to player. Sometimes the more expensive ones like this one will just give you a constant buff at 10 yards to each club card is absolutely excellent. Good luck affording her. All right, so we are ready to fulfill a hole. 
Uh, I'll show you what this card, this bonus card does in just a second. The relevant number here, the uh, most important number is the yardage. You have to play cards equal to the yardage. This, this number will indicate how well you did. Doesn't really matter. Just gives you a sense of what you want to do. So if you're playing just general chip shot cards, I'm adding 30 yards, which is whatever, but I'm going to see how many of these I have to play in order to hit 360. That is not going to do it. That is way more than four. <laughs> so we're not going to play that. Good. Lucky for me, I've already gone to the market and I've purchased better cards. All right, so here are my better cards with my better yardage. If I had played the chip shot or a similar card, I would just play it and start racking up yardage. There are specialty cards though. So let me go ahead and show you the pitching wedge. Pitching wedge is cheap, but uh, because you're using cheap clubs, it introduces a little bit of a hitch into your game that you have to spend a little bit of extra time to resolve. The game reflects that by using this uh, duff card. So you would this would not count uh, in the game, but uh, in the current hole, but it would go into your deck and you'd have to play it if you wanted to shoot for another hole unless you call it. And there's usually some sort of penalty involved. But you'd still get the whatever that is. All right, so now, oh, not that one. Now I'm gonna really uh, knock out some yardage. I got 275 over here. And it shows a horseshoe. A horseshoe indicates pulling from the luck deck. So I play it and I pull from the luck deck. Sometimes you get something good. Woohoo! Lucky break. Gain the top card of the pro shop deck just for free. Woohoo! That is amazing. Or you can have bad luck. Kaka! Back <laughs> by mischief. What kind of golf course is this? <laughs> Minus 75 yards. No! <laughs> Uh, so that's not a very good thing. Uh, so you can see the game tends a little bit towards the whimsical uh, rather than uh, the serious. Last thing I'm going to play, and this always has to be a part of anything that I play, is the putter. Always close with a putter. They generally uh, very, very low yardage, if any. Uh, this is the basic putter that you can get. There's a whole bunch of copies of them on the bottom of the play area. And they would add a ton of strokes. So you, you want to try to upgrade these as much as possible, but you might want to just get holes done quickly so that three putt is there for you. So then I'll play these cards and that would add them up. So then that would be 370 according to my math in five strokes. So a little bit one over par, uh, which that doesn't really matter. What really matters is the number, uh, five points. Uh, a couple things happen at that point. First of all, I would take my player card um, and I would put that there indicating that I've gone there and I can't go there again and If you are first and this is a two-player game, so there is a bonus card There's always one less the number of players. I would just get a card. Woohoo! Wow train gopher caddyshack boom <laughs> uh, Free card that goes into your hand. So or, or not now goes into your discard that will come up in your hand later All right, so that is how you score you're gonna move through the nine uh, different holes and then once somebody completes nine holes uh there'll be one last round and we add up the score all right so very quickly let me show you some aspects of the player area so this is your deck that's um pretty standard stuff if i draw my five cards i have my beginning deck and i play them let's say i you know, have to play this whiff get out of here duff card don't like you and i've played let's say i bought something at the market for 60. those get discarded i can use there is a section here called the caddy card where I can reserve a card in order to be able to use it next turn. Uh, basically kind of a six card in your hand. Your caddy is always uh, useful. All right, so then you also indicate your nine holes over here. So as you reveal, you're gonna be putting the token on the hole as I demonstrated. You're gonna be revealing different powers. So like I reveal A, A says, a player may trash up to one chip shot for twice its credit value on the turn. So basically, um, and this is available to everybody. The first person that reveals an A, that every player at the table can do that action of, of trashing a chip card. Kind of the game's way of pushing everybody forward. Everybody needs to call. <laughs> uh, the game just says, all right, we'll uh, put in mechanisms to everybody can call. Don't have to specifically focus on it if you don't want to. You're gonna play more, you're gonna get a B power. The B power says that you can play a recently purchased card onto your caddy so they're available more immediately. And then C, you can place up to two cards. So uh, extra powers that you get, that again, they unlock universally. So one player does it, anybody can get it. 
uh, and so that you can get better cards earlier and keep the game moving forward. All right, this is the solo mode, which is completely different. <laughs> Forget everything that I've taught you about the game. It takes the components of the game and, and refashions it into something completely different, which is a variant of Klondike Solitaire. I have taken all of the whole cards, made them into a deck, and dealt out three. I have taken all of the club cards in the market, including some starters, and I've made my own player deck, so there's nothing but club cards in here. I have taken the equipment and set that aside. Uh, I have taken the luck cards and the duff cards, set that aside as well, and that's all I need to play. So in true Klondike Solitaire fashion, I'm going to begin by drawing three cards. And I play them one at a time. So then if I have a card like this, it would have 170 yards, it would go here. I'd be playing the cards on uh, any particular hole. Uh, the kick is, just like Klondike, you have to play them in descending order. So the next card is this 8 iron, it would be 110, which is less than 170. I would be fine with that. However, I could not play this 220 yard card over here. I would have to choose it to choose to play it somewhere else. Same rules in terms of the duff cards and the luck cards. As you play them, you would pull something, but then it would apply. It wouldn't go into your deck. It would apply to the hole. So this would apply right away. I would gain a top card of the, the, the stack, which I'd be able to play immediately. Or if it happened to be one of them lightning bolts, I would get a duff, and then the duff would just play right on there and affect what was going on. Uh, on a later turn, I would play one, two, three cards. Do it again, see what I wanted to do. So in this case, I got a chip shot. That would be a, not a great card to put anywhere because it's the lowest value card. So I just pass and keep going and do it again and again and again until this deck ran out. This, these cards would be removed, so the deck is gonna get smaller and smaller as I score. And I would note the score on my score pad. Once I go through this deck uh, once, uh, let's say I had flipped them all, I had uh, turned them all over into the discard, you would just turn them over, go through the deck again, go through it a third time, add up your score. Any hole that you'd not complete is worth double par, so you would score six, it's a terrible score on there, but otherwise you were just gonna add up your points and uh, see how you did. All right, so that was Duffers at the table. Normally how I like to review games is I would like to break down the game in both its thematic qualities as well as its strategic qualities, the uh, headspace that I'm concerned about, uh, the imaginative and evocative experience that the game brings out of you thematically, as well as the decision space, the turn-by-turn -turn, uh, puzzle or whatever it is that you're trying to solve. So let's talk theme first. Uh, this one is clearly designed by somebody who loves golf. <laughs> there are so many golf isms in here. You got the clubs and the irons and the woods and you have different, um, you know, the, the pars and the holes and the character of the holes, how each one kind of has little wrinkles to it. There's, there's so many little nods to someone who just loves golf and, and just kind of sat there. I almost kind of picture the designer saying, uh, I really want a golf game to exist. <laughs> I want to bring my passion to life. I think of uh, most recently Super Skill Pinball, how uh, the designer there loved pinball, made it made it work. Um, I have a couple of games by Genius Games. You know, they made science work. So you can just tell um, that they this person wanted to bring golf to life. And they brought it to life in this kind of like kind of leaning towards the whimsical. You know, I showed you in the overview, like, you know, the magpie, the the golf, the the raven kind of like taking a golf ball. <laughs> um I didn't know quite how to feel about that. I feel like that if you know if you want to play golf, play golf. I mean, golf is a wonderful game. You know, maybe tune kind of the, the the humor part down a little bit. But then again, it's a family game, so you know that's a decision that the you know the company made for in terms of its audience. You know, just wanted to kind of present that that um, you know there's different ways that you could have gone with the theme, and they definitely went a little bit more towards the whimsical side. All right, so um, it is a deck builder, so that means a couple of things uh, to players out there. It generates, it, it's, deck builders generate an experience. They, they generate, uh, you know, optimization engines and, you know, having your little deck and, you know, growing it into something that, you know, you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, how is successful is the game at that? What I will say 
is that it is going for a casual feeling right off the bat this is a in terms of that you know like the, the spectrum like you can have really heavy ones really light ones um it's going towards the light uh and the casual and the family friendly so the river is definitely a more tactical approach to deck building than the uh st the fixed deck like an aeon zend or a dominion uh that's where you get a little bit more strategy a little bit more long-term planning involved the river you you, you get what you get <laughs> Uh, and that that's that's the first bit of luck in this game. Uh, the second bit is the luck cards. So you play certain clubs and you pull a card, and those are really swingy. Like you could get a couple of extra yards, which be which is amazing. You could get extra yards that take you out of range of the hole, which would be terrible, <laughs> or, the, or the hole that you're going for. Um, so a good card can become bad. You have cards that could just completely interrupt your flow uh or cards that just kind of barely make a difference so really really um like not like impossibly it doesn't doesn't destroy the strategy of the game but it really flavors up uh in terms of people that have their core um thing that they're going for and i'll talk about that in just a second uh but th no matter what you do go for the approach you're going for those luck cards man um they can really, you know, swing a game. And the last bit of luck is the fact that you get uh, a free card whenever you're uh, not the last person to complete a hole. That can either be a junkie card or it can be some thing that's 200 credits and just completely make your game. <laughs> Again, that, that it's all within keeping. It all kind of coheres together in the kind of experience that this game wants to evoke. Is this game a total luck fest? Absolutely not. There are strategies. There are there are different paths to victory. You can construct your deck so that you like are almost like a quick strike deck. Like, you know, you know you're not going to make the big holes, but you want to get the the bottom holes fast, construct your deck that way. You can do the deck builder thing. Lots of equipment, lots of card draw, lots of culling. You optimize, get that crafted deck going. Uh you can you can go that way. Um I, I had a little baby. I, I'm just not as good a player at that strategy, but I didn't have as much success as just, you know, just going after, you know, holes and everything uh, quickly. You can go after bigger holes. You can, uh, you know, you can optimize, to like, you know, you get a lot of dove cards, but you get a lot of culling to kind of take care of those dove cards very quickly. There's different paths to victory. You're not just kind of roped in to a certain path, which I thought was, uh, which I really appreciate. I thought that was pretty good. So two more ways that this, this game is basically constructed for that kind of like gateway family style. Um, the either, I didn't say this in the overview, but you can construct the market deck so that uh, there's star cards. So it's basically kind of seeding the beginning of the deck to make very early, easy purchases, easy to understand purchases. It, it doesn't throw you in the deep end of complexity, just kind of... Um, a giant complicated deck at the beginning. You can craft the market deck so that it's easier. People could come in and play pretty uh, pretty quickly. That's cool. Or if you're a veteran player, you don't have to ignore that. Just kind of you know uh, do what you got to do. And the last thing that there was that was pretty good about in terms of the access to the game is that over the years, deck builders have acquired a couple of qualities that people get annoyed by. Right. <laughs> um, so you're talking stuff like culling, right? It's a great idea to start with a weenie deck and, and, and build into something good, but you got to figure out what to do with those weenie cards. And a lot of times they just kind of get in the way and you end up making purchases that aren't that exciting. Like they're only there to take out trash. They're not there to really make your deck better, make the, make the experience more fun. Uh, you know, a, a getting a, a, a card that only calls is not that exciting unless you're into the pure optimization puzzle, puzzle a little bit, then go have fun. <laughs> that is not me as a gamer. I want to make purchases that move me forward. Don't like, you know, take out the trash. Uh, what the game does is it has a lot of um, ways to deal with culling. It has free culling. If one person gets a hole, everybody gets a free call. Um, the, uh, the equipment always gives you like call and draw. And there's all different ways of, um, it, it's almost like, uh, you know, speaking of a designer that wanted to like make a golf game I, I i feel like the designer was like okay i love deck building and there's these problems the next time i make a deck building game i'm gonna get rid of the problems i'm gonna <laughs> develop ways to deal with issues so the calling part is one of them and the other one is the issue where you're getting cards the the later cards that you buy aren't that exciting or like they're, they're just for points to not to kind of move you forward uh and and be active in the game so 
because in a normal deck builder, they go in your discard pile, and by then your deck is fat, and you know, or it's only a turn or two left, and you can't use them. So the, the game deals with that by letting you buy them and, and put them in your caddy. So then when you, at the later game, when you buy the card that's in your caddy, it's like, wow, I just bought uh, a giant card and I can use it immediately, or I, or I uh, can sneak in a, a putt. Right. Uh, I, I'm really desperate for a putt. And I was like, I can't get it. It's in the deck. Oh, I can go buy it. So a good strategist would have you know, kind of planned for that. But you don't have to in this game. <laughs> it's, it's right there for you. So a, another way in which a it deals with the issues of deck building and B is not as strategic as all that. It is very, very tactical. Uh, so that's the breakdown of the multiplayer game. Solo. <laughs> it breaks my heart. I am a soloist. Uh, I think a lot of people know. I really look forward to any game with a solo mode. This is not a solo mode of deck builder, uh, of duffers, or any game. It is a completely different game. It, just because it uses the same um, components, and it, it does give you the opportunity to cut, you know, get to know the cards, and the cards all work the same, but they work the same in a very, very different context, that Klondike context. Um, disappointing in two ways. Uh, first of all, I, I think you know Klondike not a like a great game in the sense that it doesn't. There's not a lot of agency, but it is a great game in the sense that it is meditative. It's easy. It flows. You can get into a just good a good you know forget everything flow. You know, let me five minutes go away. Uh, predictable and like th that's part of the strength. And that's part of the, the stick-to-itiveness and the lasting quality of a game like Klondike Solitaire. Um, this game, it, you know, it doesn't flow. Uh, at least the, the solo mode, it doesn't really flow. Like, you get, like, you know, you can get lucky cards that just kind of knock you off. And y you have still processing to do when you're, you know, uh, calculating. You know, if you have a, you're going for, like, a 600 uh, par hole. And you have, like, mm, this, 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 and this, and this. It's like, I, I don't want that. I want, if, if I'm going to play a, a Solitaire experience i just want to be able to like play that's it that's it F pull and play pull and play i don't want to like pause um you know are people like do people enjoy that experience absolutely uh maybe and that's why i was happy to present it but for me I, I didn't i didn't appreciate the experience at all and the second disappointment that i had with the solo mode was i don't know it feels a little bit deceptive to call it a one to four player game is this is a two to four player game and it has a variant that I think might have been better served to be like an extra a posted on BGG, posted on the website. It's like, oh, here you have this game. Here's another thing that somebody has done. And, you know, here's another way to play it. To advertise this as a one to four player game gives me the consumer the impression that I'm getting a one player deck builder, a solo deck builder, which I like. I like solo deck builders, and I like this game. Uh, you know, a lot of the games that I played in this was just multi-hand solitaire, playing one side, playing the other. And I'm like, this is cool. I, I like so much of what's going on here. Um, you know, the the, um, the you know the going for holes and the you know the crafting of the deck and mixing up the different strategies. I would love to have had that as a solo, but I get a Klondike solitaire variant instead. I don't want to go on too long about this because at the end of the day, it won't figure that much into my final rating. But I really did want to point that out as a, a disappointment. Uh, I, I think that not every game needs a solo mode. If it can't support it, then don't put it in. Notwithstanding, final thoughts. I'm going to go ahead and give this one a 7 out of 10 seal of approval. Uh, it is for somebody. And I, it, is, it, is, it is for me in the sense that I like the version of fun that this presents. It presents a tactical game, a cute game, a sporting type of, type of guy. Not Golf is not necessarily my game, but I have played. I've played and watched, and I know what I'm doing. And it's one of those games that I, I, I enjoy being in that space, and I enjoy having that option. If I want to play this game with, in a family setting, maybe, you know, my dad, who is a golfer, wants to sit down and play, or your uncle in, or your father-in-law. <laughs> Someone, oh, I need to bridge the gap with my father-in-law. He likes golf, and I've definitely seen that uh, scenario happen. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of uses for this game for a low, very tactical, um, golf-infused experience. There's definitely a place for that. Um, you know, Buyer beware if you're expecting anything, anything more strategic uh, than that. And solo, mm, that that not you're not going to want to uh, buy this game for solo. At, at least I don't think, unless you appreciate that Klondike solitaire experience. 
So that was uh, Duffers. Uh, if you want to know more about me and the content that I create, please visit me at my channel, Shelf Stories. Shelf Stories is my channel where I present tips and tricks on how to be a healthier gamer and a healthier person through my mental health shelf help series and all the other good stuff too, conversations with gamers, uh, playthroughs and walkthrough or uh, unboxings and different gaming content. So this is Jason reminding you, if you can change your mind, you can change the world. So until next time, later everybody.